John L. Sorensen is Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at Brigham Young University. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in archaeology from BYU, a master's degree in meteorology from the California Institute of Technology, and a PhD in anthropology from the Univers University of California at Los Angeles. He originated the program of anthropology at BYU, heading it for 14 of his 24 years of faculty service. His primary academic and professional emphasis was in the sociocultural uh, an in sociocultural anthropology, including many years as an applied anthropologist. Among other positions, he served as director of social sciences at General Research Corporation in Santa Barbara, California in the 1960s, and later founded Bonneville Research Corporation in Provo, Utah. He is the author of more than 200 publications. Despite following a variety of other professional interests throughout his career, Dr. Sorensen never lost his strong interest in Mesoamerican archaeology, the subject that first drew him to anthropology. Since his retirement from BYU in 1986, he has concentrated his research and writing in that area. One of the key figures in the early development of the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, now part of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, Dr. Sorensen served for several years as the editor of its Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. His 1985 book, An Ancient American Setting for the Book of Mormon, published by Farms and Deseret Book, has become the most influential treatment of Book of Mormon peoples in history in the Mesoamerican context. I have that book myself, it's very good. Dr. Sorensen and his late, white cat, late, white cat, late wife, Catherine, sorry, reared nine children. In 1993, he married Helen Lance Christ, Christiansen, mother of nine. They reside in Provo, Utah. His presentation is Reading Mormon's Codex. Dr. Sorensen. I don't, th I don't think I have to apologize for not having visuals. I'm talking about a book. <laughs> and a book, a book is print. That's what I'm going to read to you. Beginning as early as 1955, I undertook to synthesize what I was learning about ancient southern Mexico and northern Central America to answer the question. Thank, thank you. Well, now I can't see my paper. <laughs> now I have completed what will no doubt be my last major work intended to report what I learned, what I have learned over more than 60 years of professional study of this matter. The book is entitled Mormon's Codex, and the pre this presentation offers a preview of its essentials. The content is presented in language that speaks to both the informed general reader and to archaeologists, although I have strived to avoid the professional jargon of that genre as much as possible. The full argument provides lengthy, explanation, lengthy, lengthy explanations, extensive footnotes, over 1,300 bibliographical references, three appendices, and a dozen detailed maps. The volume will be published by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU and perhaps co-published by Deseret Book. After some interval, it will be issued also as an e-book. The demanding editing process for the print edition is now nearing an end. It is hoped that it will appear around the beginning of 2013. A great deal of preparatory research lies behind the book that may not be apparent even to readers of it. I have always worked out in great detail crucial aspects of the data I use, especially when they contradict the position of conventional scholars. As a single example, note that I, with Martin Reish, long ago addressed the question of whether voyagers to or from the New World in ancient times actually crossed the oceans. Our definitive bibliographical work comprised two volumes of 1,200 pages that abstracted relevant content from over 5,000 printed sources. This and other comprehensive and labor-intensive studies preceded and undergirded my decision six years ago to produce Mormon's Codex as the capstone of my research on this topic. I chose to follow a research model recently used in studying the relationship between the Old Testament and archaeology, an obviously parallel case. 
William Deaver, who's a professor at Arizona State, used it in his 2003 book entitled, What Did the Biblical Writers Know and When Did They Know It? There he vigorously disputed the view held by some modern scholars that the Hebrew scripture was first written in the last few centuries BC on the basis only of oral traditions and historical conjectures projected back by anonymous writers on the previous th several thousand years. Deaver, an eminent archeologist, redeems the status, the status of the Old Testament as a broadly reliable history. He proceeds by identifying what he calls convergences. These are specific points of agreement between the statements in the text and finds by archeologists. When the written source is supported by this sort of external evidence, no explanation for the convergence between factual information of the two sources makes sense except that the archeological data and the scripture refer to the same moment in time and that the author of the written account could not have put down what he did without contemporary knowledge of the circumstances and history of that area of the world. For example, Deaver explains that, quote, the many biblical passages that mention city gates fit remarkably well with what is known from excavated gates at a number of sites of the 10th to 7th centuries BC and only of this period. No writer, no writer living several centuries later could have invented references to city gates like those known only long before. Using numerous instances of this logic, the author shows convincingly that the his historical skeleton, whose bones, as it were, show through in the Old Testament, was real. I follow the same logic in identifying what I call correspondences instead of convergences between the archaeological record for Mesoamerica and the text of the Book of Mormon. While Deaver identified a few score of convergences to support the historicity of the Old Testament, I identify some 420 correspondences that tie the Book of Mormon to the picture of ancient Mesoamerican civilization constructed by archeologists and other researchers. A vital step in this procedure was to identify Book of Mormon lands it was a simple matter for Professor, Professor Deaver to specify Syria-Palestine area in the centuries before about 400 BC as the setting where he found his Old Testament parallels. <clears throat> Everyone knows that Palestine is where the Israelite narr narrative took place. But the where of the Book of Mormon is not obvious. First, it is necessary to establish the location correctly or else any reference to potential Book of Mormon comparisons to archaeology would be an error. Two steps re are required to settle Book of Mormon geography. The first is to construct an internal map that accommodates all 500 passages in the Book of Mormon that state or imply geographical facts. I did this in pre previous books, determining that all of these statements fit consistently into what I call Mormon's map. The second step was to compare that map that existed in Mormon's mind, based entirely on statements in the text, with the geography of the Americas in order to find the best fit. That task is simplified by the fact that the Nephites dwelt in cities and had many books that contained their written records. There's only one area in the New World meeting those conditions, Mesoamerica. The remaining question then is, in what portion of Mesoamerica do the details of Mormon's map fit? Again, in several published formats, I have, I have added, addressed that question, all the possible geographical correlations Latter-day Saints have come up with, except one, display fatal flaws that rule out their identification as the territory Mormon had in his mind. The one satisfactory answer goes like this. 
the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in southern Mexico is the narrow neck of land of the Nephites. The highlands of southern Guatemala contain the land of Nephi. The basin of the Grijalva <coughs> the, <coughs> <excuse me, coughs> the River and adjacent areas in southern Mexico is the land of Zarahemla and areas immediately north and west of the Isthmus are the land northward. This then defines the area where it makes sense to look for correspondences between the Book of Mormon and the archaeological uh, cultural record. The correspondences. Beyond an introduction, Mormon's codex is arranged in two parts. The first consists of 14 chapters treating various cultural topics. For example, writing and records, society, government, warfare, and ideology and religion. The five chapters that follow deal with history and archaeology. Now you will realize, of course, that trying to compress the detailed data in uh, an 800-page book to a presentation here in less than an hour is challenging, at the, to say the least. So I can only present a sample of the, con of the uh, agreements that I find between the two sources. First, geography. Given the broad geographical placement already sketched, in the book I identify 25 pointed correspondences between the map features near the Isthmus of Tehuantepec on the one hand and Book of, Mor book of Mormon lands on the other. Here I list only three of the 25. One, according to the Nephite record, a narrow pass connected the land northward from the land southward at a strate strategic point within the narrow neck. A minor elevation a number of miles long occurs in the geology of the isthmus that forms a pass over which ancient and modern communication links run northward and southward above annual floodwaters. Two, the account in Alma chapter two of a battle between Nephite rebels and loyalists begins on a hill across the Sidon River immediately east of the capital city. From there, the rebels were pursued up to the nearby land of Gideon. Then they moved back down to the Sidon where a battle ensued at a ford across the river. Precise, plausible parallels are found in the upper basin of the Grijalva River for all geographical features reported. Three, the hill Rama of the Jaredites, which is the same as the hill Camorra of the Nephites, was where the final extermination of both peoples took place. That hill corresponds in all relevant parameters to Cerro El Vigia in the Tuxla Mountains of, southern, of South Central Veracruz. Writing systems and records. The Book of Mormon describes literate cultures from the third millennium BC to the end of the record early in the fifth century AD. The Book of Mormon reports multiple writing systems in use. Mesoamerican cultures use writing systems of a similar nature from at least the second millennium BC down to the Spanish conquest. Several distinct scripts were in use in that area as far back as several millennia ago, although little is known about them. Many uses of written, this is number two, many uses of written documents are known from Mesoamerica at least 14 of those uses are represented or are referred to in the Nephite record. For example, records of contemporary events, letters of correspondence, adventures of individual heroes and villains, and genealogies. Number three, in Mesoamerica, as in the Book of Mormon, lineage histories provide, provided validation of a lineage right to rule or other political claims and were displayed and read publicly on ceremonial occasions to assert that fact. Furthermore, Mesoamerican lineage histories and the Book of Mormon correspond also to more specific ways. Four of them are 
Fourth, the accounts were geographically selective, telling only of events and figures important to the people whose history they comprised, while effectively ignoring groups deemed not significant. Five, competition among the elite factions for the right to rule meant that histories were considered political weapons. Winners tried to eliminate the pos position of rivals by destroying their records. Six, these records included predictions about the lineage's future history. Seven, lineage history also served to define relationships to neighboring co uh, peoples. Human biology, only three. The skin color of some Native American groups in Mexico and Central America, according to early Spanish observers, were virtually the same as European white people. This corresponds to the Book of Mormon description of its Nephite population as fair as against the darker, more numerous Lamanites. Two, artistic representations of individuals from ancient Mesoamerica patently, patently show that among, among them are Mediterranean-looking folks, as well as Asians, Oceanians, and Africans. Moreover, a minority of specifically Semitic people are seen also to be one component among ancient Mesoamericans according to art. Three, Mesoamerican art also represents substantial beards whose parallels in ancient times is almost exclusively with the Near East. Those representations are concentrated in the area in Mesoamerica where and at the time when Book of Mormon peoples apparently dwelt. Political economy. One, both in Mesoamerica and in Book of Mormon societies and elite, formally dominated in political, social, and economic terms, similar to the patterns in all ancient civilizations. But note, completely different from the early 19th century rural New York State. Now, both sources confirm the following. Two rulers and their dependents held their positions in accordance with an ideology that considered traditional, uh, sometimes divine, rulership as part of the natural social order. Three, the perquisites of the ruling elite granted them legal power and an economic mechanism through tribute assessments to amass considerable wealth. Customs associated with kingship and nobility limited their personal use of that wealth Nevertheless, they exercise much power by virtue of it. Number four, priests were usually closely associated with the dominant elite. Their teaching of, the, of a traditional ideology pro providing validation for the structure of exploitation by the priests. Society. Mesoamerican scholars have concluded that the primary social actors in ancient Mesoamerica were not individual persons so much as social groups. Analysis of Book of Mormon societies reveals the same. Individuals as such did not count for as much as social elements, especially those based on some version of extended kinship. Again, this view is contrary to the norms of early 19th century USA. Two, one of the nuclear family's primary functions in society, both in Mesoamerica and according to the Nephite record, was to provide instruction to children and youth through what has been called moral discourse, preaching sermons to them. Three, polygynous marriage was practiced on a limited basis in Mesoamerica as well as in some Book of Mormon societies. Four, full-fledged social class structures prevailed in many Mesoamerican societies. The primary distinction was between nobles and commoners, according to both the scripture and native history. Both the social classes, moreover, social classes among the Nephites were reported during two periods, the first and second centuries BC, 
and the third and fourth centuries AD, both times when Mesoamerican classes were highly visible. Five, socio-political factions anxious to gain power and privilege were endemic in Book of Mormon societies as well as in Mesoamerica. Their jostling caused most of the socio-political stress the scripture reports. Mesoamerican factionalism was equally pronounced and disruptive. Religion was an important basis for differ differentiating social groups according to both secular and Book of Mormon sources. Groups usually had a dominant deity as integrator and protector over them. They had a material culture. And this has only a half dozen out of a total of uh, 45 in the book. Cultivation, according to both the Book of Mormon and Mesoamerican sources, was entirely without the use of animal power. Two, wine, referred to in the Book of Mormon, could have been prepared using several plants, including the grape, as in the Old World. But distilled liquors were not known. Spaniards invariably called native intoxicants wine, and they spoke also of plots that contained maguey plants, the source of the intoxicant pulque, as vineyards, a term used in the Book of Mormon for plantings that yielded wine. Three, the single Jaredite mention of elephants in the third millennium BC corresponds with paleontological discovery that mastodons survived in certain environments in the Americas as late as 2000 BC or beyond, long past the supposed date of extinction of those animals. Four, a dearth of timber is reported by Nephite colonists, colonists of the land northward in the first century BC, where it is said that cement became the preferred building material. North, north and west of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, archeology span shows the use of cement began about the first century BC. Six, sacred towers were constructed by the Nephites that were similar to Mesoamerican towers or pyramidal substructures. All such construction having had a primarily religious purpose. Moreover, the one instance in the book of Helaman when a private tower structure was used as a site for prayer and religious discourse has Mesoamerican parallels. Seven, the model for Nephite temples was specifically the Temple of Solomon, which featured two non-structural pillars that stood at the sides of the door of the temple. Some Mesoamerican temples displayed similarly structurally, similar structurally unnecessary pillars. Eight, silk and linen are mentioned in the Book of Mormon as fabrics utilized by his people. At least five fabrics spe specified as like silk were reported from native Mexico by the Spaniards. Henneken, a widely used Mesoamerican fiber, made a fabric that was a near equivalent of linen. Nine, hundreds of miles of roads were constructed in Mesoamerica as early as the time of Christ. At that time, the Book of Mormon describes highways that were cast up. Mesoamerican roads were often cast up, that is, were constructed of raised fill that was then smooth surfaced. Government, all of these are documented in both sources. One central to ancient governance was the idea that kings, or at least at lesser levels, lords or nobles, were divinely designated or were themselves considered divine with powers conferred on them by right. This was contrary, of course, to New England where the Book of Mormon was first published. Two, governments were evidently fragile. Factionalism in the ruling stratum was endemic. Three, political schisms or fissions often resulted in dissident social elements fleeing in order to establish independent kingdoms or cultures. 
for the election or ratification of a new ruler by vote of his subjects was sometimes the custom. Five, major rulers occupied a palace. Residences of lesser rulers were not considered palaces. Six, a new, that is, younger king was sometimes installed before the death of a previous ruler who then served out his life as an emeritus king. Seven, the judicial function required a corps of judges who served under the nominal chief judgeship of the monarch. Several levels of judicature existed, difficult cases being referred to higher levels. Warfare. It's obvious that the Book of Mormon would provide many parallels here. Warfare was of major significance in the cultural history of both Mesoamerica and Book of Mormon peoples. Recognition of its significance represents a major change in archaeological thought in recent decades. That area's war practices now align more directly with those described in, book, in Mormon's book. Two, wars in Mesoamerica were typically th fought during the time of the year when they did not interfere with ag agricultural activities, society's greatest priority. The same timing is reflected in the Book of Mormon account of, accounts of warfare. Three, religion played a major role in warfare and was sometimes the primary cause of conflict, according to both sources. Fourth, guidance was sought through priestly oracles in planning and conducting military operations. Five, feuds between contending peoples could last for generations. Six, armed forces were composed of geographically based militia armies. There were no large, no large standing armies. Mass hand-to-hand -hand combat was the normal fighting mode. Seven, the heads of local armies were called captains or chief captains and so on who held rank according to a hierarchical pattern. Eight, companies of warriors were sometimes called sons by their captains. Nine, some Mesoamerican armies were composed of units of 10,000 men, as were Nephite units at the time of their final war. 10, the most widespread form of fortification was made by excavating a dry moat throwing up the soil up on the inner bank against the timber palisade and building another line of erect timbers atop it. 11. At least five types of weapons used by Book of Mormon armies correspond to those used in Mesoamerica. 12. Moroni carried a flag or virtual battle standard while rallying his force. In Mexico, a standard on a pole was strapped to a commander's back as he led his men into battle. 13. Mesoamerican wars sometimes continued until the victorious commander was able to, quote, drink the blood, unquote, of the enemy leader. A Lamanite leader made that very threat against a Nephite captain. Ideology and religion. One, a complex of 380 cultural patterns having to do with religion and ideology were present both in the civilization of the ancient Near East in the second and first millennia BC and in Mesoamerican civilization. These correspondences, which are discussed in a separate publication from the book, can only be explained by calling on transoceanic voyaging, plausibly including voyages represented in the Book of Mormon. Two, at least 62 of the 380 features are documented or are implied in the Book of Mormon. Three, mortality was viewed by at least some Mesoamerican thinkers and by Nephi prophets as a test of a person's conformity to a set of moral standards, the, the degree of that conformity to be a matter for divine judgment. Four, some Book of Mormon peoples 
as, as much as certain Mesoamericans anticipated a post-mortal residence in a paradise or ultimately a resurrection. Five, spiritual renewal was symbolized by a seed or plant growing from the inner organs of human bodies. Six, in certain times and cultures, a Mesoamerican cult of salvation appeared that promised immortality to observant persons. The same was true of Book of Mormon believers. Seven, a Mesoamerican myth of the fall of the first couple as a result of disobedience to the Creator's command compares to the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden as repeated in the Book of Mormon. Eight, the practice is described by Nephite historians as priestcraft, that is priestly ex exploitation of devotees for private economic gain, is documented in the Book of Mormon and is supposed by scholars to have been a common feature of Mesoamerican religious life. Nine, prophets, both legitimate and false, as well as seers who sometimes gazed into sacred oracular stones were shared features of religious life. 10, a form of ritual washing termed baptism was also found in both. 11, sacrifice was extensively practiced in the Mesoamerican, in Mesoamerica and among the Nephites. The commonest type was the shedding of the blood of an animal although other offerings were also made. Twelve, a form of communion was practiced both by Mesoamerican and Nephites in which food items or food emblems representing the body of a, of a savior deity were eaten. Thirteen, legends in Mesoamerica tell of the disappearance of special persons said to have been taken away without suffering death. Some persons are characterized in the same manner in the third, in the Book of Mormon. 14, a pattern of ritual and belief, that is, elements of the cult referred to above that had, been, that had arrived anciently from the Near East, was abruptly terminated in the first century AD, at least in southern Mesoamerica. This change corresponds in time, place, and in part in nature to that reported in the Book of Mormon at the time of Christ's command to the people of the Book of Mormon that they cease the rites of the Law of Moses. The next three chapters are on archaeology and history. First, before 600 BC. One, the Book of Ether pictures only Jaredite pictures early Jaredite demography making clear inferentially that an indigenous population already occupied the land where they arrived. That fact agrees with the scientific picture of Mexico in the third millennium BC. Two, a decline of the society in which the Jaredites lived took place over a period of several centuries before their extinction around 600 BC. The Olmec cultural tradition declined and disappeared from the culture, his, culture history of Mexico on the same time scale. Three, the archaeological site at San Lorenzo Tenochtitlan in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, a preeminent Olmec city, coincided in time and place with the great city built by Jaredite King Lib at a spot by the narrow neck of land. Four, the Jaredites used at least one writing system which their founders had brought from Mesopotamia. From three to perhaps five systems of writing were employed in Mesoamerica by the end of the Jaredite era. The next section is on archaeology from 600 uh, to uh, 1 BC. And this includes, I can only give here 15, out of 79 correspondences in the book. One, soon after their arrival in the Promised Land, presumably in Guatemala, the Nephites moved to nearby highlands where they became farmers. 
Lamanites remained in the lowlands where they lived by hunting and took on darker skins. Pacific lowlanders at the time of the Spanish conquest had notably darker skins than highlanders for whatever reason. Two small clay figurines from the Valley of Guatemala dated about 300 BC have skin surfaces shaded white. Incidentally, figurines from the Old World from Jerusalem dated at 600 BC when Lehi left were all white skinned. Other figurines from Guatemala are shaded reddish brown. These model differences between fair Nephites and dark Lamanites, that is, they model differences. But about 200 BC, the light complexion figurines ceased being made, which is about when Le Mosiah led his Nephites away to Zarahemla. Three, near the time when Mosiah's party left, some evidence of warfare is found in the archaeology of the Valley of Guatemala, along with a decrease in population that could mirror Mosiah's group's departure. Four, a great wall, so named by archaeologists, 22 feet high, protected a portion of the ancient ruined city now called Kaminakuyu near Guatemala City. Only limited parts of the site can now be excavated because of building, suburban building upon the site. In concept, timing, and scale, it is apparently similar to the wall built by the Nephites around the city of Nephi. Five, at Kaminahuyu, the oldest great city in southern Mesoamerica, rapid urbanization from about 600 to 200 BC compares with what the Book of Mormon pictures for the city of Nephi. The scale of public works erected is impressive. Six, writing, only occurring on scattered monuments, was in use at Kaminahuyu from 500 to 200 BC and even later, confirming the early status of civilization at that place. The Book of Mormon reports literacy at the city of Nephi between 575 and 200 BC, as well as among the Xenophytes later located there. Seven, a pyramid at Kaminohuyu, suggested by archeologists to have functioned in part as a military watchtower, agrees in general, in time, place, and function with the Book of Mormon description of the use of such a structure in the second century BC. Eight, a major source for obsidian used to make weapons and tools is located near Guatemala City. It meets in essential respects the requirements for the place of, ar of arms spoken of in Alma chapter 47. Nine, after the general collapse of Olmec society around 600 BC, a modified version of it continued around the site of La Venta in the Isthmus. Art representations there are interpreted by some archaeologists as showing local leadership being taken over by immigrants who look like Jews. This hybrid culture came to an end by 450 BC. In Book of Mormon terms, the end of Jaredite society near 600 BC was followed by a period when some survivors of the earlier peoples probably combined with a tiny party of Mulekites in and around the city of Mulek. 10, a conflict zone has been detected by scholars that extended across southern Mesoamerica where speakers of Mihezokian tongues near the isthmus confronted northward expanding populations of Maya language speakers. Correspondingly, the combined Nephites and Milikites in the narrow neck zone were under constant expansive pressure by Lamanites from the land of Nephi on the south. 11. Ceramic and linguistic comparisons indicate that people from Highland Guatemala 
may have arrived in central Chiapas on the order of 200 BC, approximately when Mosiah led his Nephite party from the land of Nephi to Zarahemla. 12. At the ruined center, ancient site, I'm sorry, at the ruined ancient city at Santa Rosa in the upper Cuyahoga River, which qualifies as Zarahemla, a major ceremonial structure was erected in BC times in two distinct halves by two different segments of the population. That social duality is confirmed by the presence of two residential zones. Possibly the Nephi population lived in one of those segments while the people of Zarahemla occupy the other. 13. Book of Mormon statements dating to the middle of the first century BC tell of the migration of colonists from the land southward to the land northward. Significant populations move from the south of the Isthmus of Tuatapec to the north around that time as documented by archaeology in the states of Oaxaca and Veracruz. Now, archaeology and history about AD 1 to 200. One, the transition into the classic near classic era near AD 200 is often represented as an abrupt shift from a condition before civilization to one where civilization appeared. Now we know that in the so-called pre-classic, that is the Book of Mormon era, full-fledged civilization was already present in Mesoamerica. Two, areas in Mesoamerica suffered nearly simultaneous natural disasters, at least from volcanic eruptions and earthquakes in the first half of the first century AD. These phenomena were the causes of population declines, cultural disruptions, and other elements of discontinuity. Corresponding natural disasters occurred between AD 25 and 30 as reported in the Book of Mormon. Three, Mormon's record reports the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in the land of Nephi, resulting from its being, quote, covered with water, unquote. Submerged ruins dating to about the time of Christ have been discovered beneath Lake Atitlan in Guatemala, where our geographical correlation places the city of Jerusalem. Four, no later than the second century AD, archeological evidence suggests the presence of the developed cult of the feathered serpent or Quetzalcoatl. Some scholars consider this cult to have been based on the teachings of a man-god as reported in Mexican traditions. The Book of Mormon reports the appearance of the resurrected Christ among the Nephites. Five, a new pattern of society that resulted from acceptance of Christ's teachings was characterized by localized com com communalists, uh, a localized communalist economy and a classless social structure. In some parts of Mesoamerica, archaeologists have used language to describe social conditions that are congruent with those, those features. For example, burial customs tend to show that tombs were no longer used, nor were any rich burial offerings made, indicating an unranked society. Archaeology and History, AD 200 to 400, one, in this period, the cult of, that, of the feathered serpent was syncretized with various cults, variant cults. The Book of Mormon reports that in the third century, the, the Church of Jesus Christ lost its dominance among the Nephites as rival belief systems arose. Two, all the wealth expanded dramatically in step with the rise in trade and population in this period both in Mesoamerica and according to the Nephite record. Three, the rise of factions, probably based on ethnic and cult differences, complicated by governance and distinguished regions that distinguished regions from each other in much of Mesoamerica at this time. Ethnic rivalries, uh, ethnic or tribal rivalries were renewed among 
Book of Mormon groups now. No unified widespread government existed. Four, militaristic imagery became common in art and fortifications indicate that warfare now became a feature of Mesoamerican cultures. In the third century, mass warfare became general between the Nephites and the Lamanites across the old conflict zone. Five, near AD 350, the Central Depression of Chiapas, uh, which I identify with the land of Zarahemla, was depopulated almost totally due to war instigated by foes from Guatemala. At that time, the land of Zarahemla of the Nephites was largely emptied of its population when the Nephites retreated northward. Six, Nephites and Lamanites made a calendrical appointment in setting up their climac climactic battle in the land of Camorra. Mesoamerican commanders made such appointments for battle on an astrological basis. Seven, human sacrifice appears in the archeological record by the fifth century AD. The Nephite historian reports its appearance among the Lamanites in the fourth century. Eight, and final, genocidal war, as in the case of the Lamanites who exter exterminated the Nephite society near AD 400, is the ultimate end of conflict according to the Book of Mormon. The Mesoamerican record of the terminal classic era in the Maya area a few centuries later shows us such a genocide taking place. Conclusion. The intent of my book is to demonstrate that the Book of Mormon exhibits characteristics one could expect of a Mesoamerican historical document the intervening material shows that what scholars have discovered about that civilization and what the Nephite record shows are plainly related. Now it is not rational to suppose that mere coincidence can account for cors correspondence of this scale of 420 characteristics. The parallels are too striking and too sweeping to allow that casual explanation. The question of who wrote the book has been answered by some critics by supposing that young Joseph Smith was a remarkable creative author who composed the volume himself. Literary critic Harold Bloom considered Smith a religious genius, as though that label explained how he was able then to dictate this intricately plotted book of 270,000 words in less than 75 days without revising what he had dictated. Others have supposed that Smith melted together romantic notions about American Indians that were being brooded about on the New York frontier in the 1820s, along with language borrowed from the Bible. Yet another explanation is that someone more literate than he created a manuscript of the Book of Mormon which Smith pirated. The correspondences pointed out in Mormon's Codex also make an, a New York origin unbelievable. For instance, would anyone writing a book based on that area fail to mention snow, ice, or cold even a single time, or even tell about military action carried out in exhausting heat at New Year's? No such facile interpretation can account for the abundance of Mesoamerican culture and history in the book. Even the best educated scholar in the early 19th century, let alone a marginally literate frontier farmer, could not possibly have produced a volume this rich in Mesoamericanisms. In fact, even the best informed scholar now in the 21st century would find it impossible to hew so closely and subtly to Mesoamerican civilization as does the Book of Mormon. Young Smith could not have been acquainted with any scholarly knowledge about antiquity. His wife, Emma Hale Smith, said after her husband's death, Joseph Smith could neither write 
nor dictate a coherent and well-worded letter, let alone dictating a book like the Book of Mormon. Only one explanation for the Book of Mormon content is then plausible, that the text was written by a native person from southern Mexico who lived in about the fourth century. That historian editor had to have been an eyewitness of some of the events recorded and was intimately familiar with the exotic geographical setting where the actions took place. How that record reached New York State and Smith's hands and how he translated it are questions nobody is able to answer objectively at this time, but they pale in comparison to the one question, how the original work came to be. The only format in which such a record could have been presented from antiquity was as a native Mesoamerican book called by scholars a codex. In fact, some contemporary descriptions of the record, the record Joseph Smith had in his hands, make it sound like a codex. The most detailed is from Charles Anthon, a professor at Columbia College in New York City. In 1828, as Smith was beginning to translate the record from the metal plates, he made a copy of a considerable number of the characters from the record. That copy was given to an associate, Martin Harris, who took the document to Professor Anthon for con confirmation of the antiquity of the characters and the accuracy of Smith's translation. It is unclear what the savant told Harris during their interview. Years later, Smith's critics asked Anthon for his version of what transpired during the Harris's visit. An 1843 letter from him contains perhaps the best description of what Harris displayed to him. Quote, the characters were arranged in columns like the Chinese mode of writing. Greek, Hebrew, and all sorts of letters, more or less distorted, were inter intermingled with sundry de delineations of half moons, stars, and other natural objects, and the whole ended in a, r a rude representation of the Mex Mexican zodiac." End of the quote. Such a description suggests that some, suggests what someone might say after a naive look at a Mesoamerican codex. Perpendicular columns of singular characters, natural objects, segmented circles, a Mexican calendar, etc. The volume, it may be, a, it may be, a, the volume may be appropriately be called Mormon's Codex. Supposing it is authentic, it constitutes the oldest and most extensive Mesoamerican Codex known. Scholars engaged in the study of that civilization have the possibility and even the responsibility of studying this unique document as such a codex. Of course, there are statements, lots of them, in Mormon's Codex that are puzzling to Mesoamerican Meso scholars. The same is true of the Old Testament in relation to current Syro-Palestinian archaeology. Yet Deaver, while granting that certain details in the biblical history of Israel cannot yet be squared with the current archaeological, archaeological model of that area, insisted that, quote, this people, Israel, <coughs> excuse me, must not be written out of history, end of the quote. Meanwhile, the findings of modern archaeology continue to reduce the apparent disjunctions in regard to the Old Testament. Archaeologist John Clark has pointed out a similar relationship between Mesoamerican archaeology and the study of the Book of Mormon text. Quote, the trend over the last 50 years is one of convergence between the Book of Mormon and Mesoamerican archaeology. Book of Mormon claims have remained unaltered since 1830, so all the accommodation has been on the archaeology side, end of the quote. We can expect that trend to continue. Mormon's Codex, the book, carries that process of convergence further. Consequently, I say in the spirit of Professor Deaver, these Nephites 
must not be written out of Mesoamerican history. Thank you. publications or books available at the fair bookstore, particularly Mormon's Codex? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't looked. I, I must say that many of my pu publications have been by the Maxwell Institute or formerly Farms, and I think it's shameful that they have done such a poor job of distributing them. Can you comment on the interview on Mormon stories with Dr. Michael Coe? Well, uh, the comments that I prepared have been issued. Who, who, is, who knows about that? It's published on the FAIR website. It's published on the FAIR website now, just the last few days. And I recommend you to read that. It's many pages long. Is there any possibility of evidence that the Book of Mormon did not take place in Mesoamerica? Any weight to other theories or models? I, I don't even bother to deal with that issue. <laughs> Are there any evidences which, which do not point to these selected locations? Well, it depends on what people see as evidence. You were over 60 years you have over 60 years of experience as an anthropologist of the, of, ancient, uh, of the ancient Americas. In your opinion, how could Joseph Smith have written or translated the Book of Mormon as a young, relatively uneducated man unless he was a prophet of God? Uh, he was. <laughs> That's how he did it. The Book of Mormon speaks of a day and a half's journey for a Nephite across the narrow neck of land. Would this mean the entire width of the isthmus from the ocean to ocean, or could it mean a shorter distance across the central part of the isthmus? Well, that has been actually dis discussed in some places, and I won't treat it here, but it need not be all the way across, after all. It would be from, not from beach to beach, because it's talking about movement or, uh, uh, through the, the isthmus of a, a major force. So it would be from population to center to population center, somewhat less than that. If the geography can be pinpointed, how then do we explain an absence of city ruins and evidence of massive massacres of cities? There are plenty of evidences of city ruins. But until archaeology finds a way to find battlefields and excavate them, not cities, we can hardly expect massive or ma evidence of massive massacres of people. How do we account for other civilizations in the Americas such as the Incas? The world is full of civilizations. They developed according to their own accounts. After all, how much of the Bible, how much of Bible geography is in Asia, uh, that is East Asia? It's a small area that's talked about, and that's what the Book of Mormon shows. Shortly after your book came out in 1985, the General Authority stated in a conference uh, session that we should pay more attention to the message of the Book of Mormon than to where the, it took place. What was your reaction? I heartily agree. Um, my wife recently told me, as a matter of fact, in all the years that I heard you teach gospel doctrine class, never once did I hear you talk about geography. Yeah. Is there any significance to the observation that most words 
commonly associated with native North Americans, such as canoe, tomahawk, beads, tobacco, feathers, and so on, do not appear in the Book of Mormon. Well, I don't know about the, uh, that. That's part of the general picture that uh, New York makes no, it has no logical basis as the center from which a writer would have copied the characteristics. What is your response to the fact that Joseph Smith was able to translate the Book of Mormon with only one draft before it was published? How could he have accomplished this without extensive archaeological knowledge unless he was a prophet of God? Exactly. <laughs> he, he got it from Mormon. Have you found correlations to the metals and ores described in the Book of Mormon? Yes. Read the book. <laughs> Is there any evidence for Egyptian linguistic influence in Mesoamerica? Yes. Read the book. Post, uh, posting, positing Joseph Smith as the author of the Book of Mormon, what kind of degree of scholarship would he have had to possess? Are such scholars or individuals, are there such scholars today? If so, who? Darn if I know. What do you think of other theories of the, of the location of the Book of Mormon land, such as in Baja, California, and in the Great Lakes area? Well, where are the cities and books? Could you comment on why Thomas Ferguson did not find artifacts supporting Book of Mormon people? Well, Tom is a friend of mine, and I worked with him in trying to find some of what he was looking for. I found archaeological ruins. He failed to find iron ore. He just was looking for the wrong things. Do you feel that current evidence is for or against the connection of Quetzalcoatl to Jesus Christ? There is some connection, but it's very difficult to deal with because what constituted the Quetzalcoatl cult changed from time to time over centuries. And so uh, there are a lot of misinterpretations have been uh, made by uh, Latter-day Saint scholars and uh, students of the subject, but there is some connection, of course. Thank you. For those who are interested in one of his books with his signature on it, at lunchtime he'll sit at this table out by the door and he'll sign a book for you if you'd like that. Uh, get up and stretch again. All again, not a long break, sorry. But as soon as our tech people give us clearance, we'll move on to the next one.